pandemics. And as we move forward, you will understand what we are trying to achieve uh, with this speaker series and particularly everything in relation to complexity. I'm Ilona Kickbush. I'm the chair and founder of the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. And uh, I had the great honor of being involved in uh, developing this hub as well. I've never moderated beneath a dinosaur, so this is going to be a very special uh, occasion. I guess it's also a warning uh, to all of us in terms of preparedness and response, uh, what might uh, happen to us if we don't learn to deal with the complexity of pandemics. So now and then, you know, just glance over there and say, no, that is not how we want to end up. So uh, thank you uh, to whoever selected this extraordinary site, uh, which is uh, able to give us such messages. My first pleasure is to uh, invite Professor Axel Pries, uh, the Dean of the Charité, and uh, the president of the World Health Summit to say a few welcoming remarks. Please, Axel. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we have to be brave in a room like this. You had been, you, you were very brave pulling people together here, but also Chikwe and his team is very brave to start um, this really huge endeavor of a new hub in, um, in Berlin here to tackle pandemic and epidemic preparedness. Just to put it into perspective, these guys were on Earth much, much longer um, than, than we are. And if we would make it as long as they do, we um, would have made it very well. But maybe we make it even longer. Uh, but we are now in a critical phase of doing it. And this uh, critical phase is uh, fueled by our own actions. Um, our own actions with regard to nature, with regard to climate. And I think the pandemics tell us that um, they are a warning sign that we have to change our habits. And um, so preparedness uh, for, for the future needs also a mental preparedness. And I think we will hear about this today. And with that, I wish you a very, very good evening. I'm looking forward to uh, what will be presented here. And I'm also looking forward what the hub will do in Berlin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Axel. Thank you, Professor Pries. And thank you to you again for all the support the Charité gave in the very first phase of the hub here in Berlin. It was uh, truly a great support uh, for all of us that you gave us a home just around the corner from here, which is why I guess we also discovered uh, this place. So uh, we will move straight into the program now. Uh, and it's my... Uh, Great pleasure to ask uh, uh, Chikwe, and uh, if I use his whole name, Dr. Chikwe Ihe Kuyazu, uh, to come and speak to us. He is Assistant Director General at the World Health Organization and combines that very important responsibility with uh, leading the work of the hub here uh, in Berlin. Uh, truly a challenge moving between two places but it's very, very important, and he will outline this to you, why this full involvement of the hub uh, in the work of WHO on the one hand, and uh, the link particularly into all parts of WHO is so very, very critical. And on this occasion, I'd like to say a special welcome to guests we have here with us uh, today uh, from Brazil who are visiting the hub, a very big welcome to you. <laughs> and this, of course, is one of the signals. The hub is in Berlin, but the hub is global. So over to you, Chikwe, to please uh, uh, give us your vision, why we are here, and what this complexity of pandemic really means.
Thank you. Thank you, Lona. Thank you, Axel, for the, your kind words. Um, and, and welcome, welcome, colleagues, to, to this beautiful venue. Um, welcome, colleagues, joining us online as well. Um, it's really the beginning of a, a new era. And what we're trying to create in this speaker sp series that we've called Complexity of Pandemics is really recognizing with a bit of humility the challenge that we have ahead of us. And I remember this theme came up with a conversation with Ilona and we were talking about how hard this problem is to, to crack. And we thought of a, a term that will um, reflect the complexity but also reflect our responsibility uh, for it. So we want to really create a space that is at the intersections of the various disciplines uh, that we work in uh, and a safe space, both online, virtually, and physically, to have the important conversations that we have to have. Seven months ago, um, when I started on this, uh, in this position uh, as new ADG for surveillance and health emergency intelligence that incorporates the hub, you know, at that point, I, I did reflect a lot that it must have taken a lot of courage for the leadership of the World Health Organization, the DG, Dr. Ryan, who leads the emergencies program, but also the leadership of the Federal Republic of Germany uh, in the middle of the pandemic to come up with a decision, acknowledging that there were some deficits in the global architecture uh, in how we were responding and having the courage to set up a new center. Remember the announcement was uh, in early 2001. It was actually made in May. Uh, so to, to, to decide in the middle of a pandemic that this was a necessary next steps and the interlocutors, Ilona, Bernhard, that led, uh, had those conversations and then actually had the courage to announce that there's a gap in our ability to respond and to respond to this gap, we are setting up a new center. So before I introduce the lady who will actually be the keynote for today, I thought to reflect a little bit on this term, pandemic and epidemic intelligence. And I thought to do so using three numbers. 197 is where I'll start from. These are the number of cases of monkeypox they were detected in Nigeria in 2017. At the time, I was the leader of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. I'd been appointed a year earlier. So this was about a year into my mission. Uh, very few people, we were a lot, very enthusiastic, but we really didn't have a lot of resources, but we knew what we had to do. And we did the best that we could. We, we sent a team to Bielsa, I still, remember the leader of that team, Adesola Ogunle, a very good committed colleague, led a team to Bielsa State in southern Nigeria, the Niger Delta, to do a classical outbreak investigation for a disease that we hadn't seen in Nigeria for 39 years. So no one in, in that had trained with me, I had never seen a case, uh, had to deal with a new infection emerging in this country. We did what we could, we investigated cases like we do in every outbreak, um, found out links, took samples, walked to the US CDC at the time to set up diagnostic capacities in Nigeria for the first time. We sent samples at the time, we didn't have sequencing capabilities within our center. We sent samples to a sister public health agency in Senegal. They did the sequencing, sent it back to us. We found out as much as we could. We shared proactively. We published there about eight publications out of Nigeria in the last three, four years. We, we made the announcements that the world should have paid attention to, but somehow it did not get the attention it deserved. And we ended up with three questions that are still questions today. Our sequencing in 2017 showed that there were multiple introductions of this virus in Nigeria. It wasn't a single outbreak that spread. There were multiple introductions. So the question was, what, how come an infection that hadn't been seen in 40 years, suddenly you see multiple introductions in several locations in a big country. Nigeria is a big country. 
Secondly, most of the cases we were seeing were in urban residents, unlike the cases in Central Africa that were mostly rural. And if the primary hypothesis was transmission from a spillover event from animals, you're unlikely to find most cases in urban dwellers. And the third important question was the source. So we, we looked very hard for an animal source. We sampled lots of animals, rodents, everything po we could possibly find, but we didn't find an animal source. So the questions that should have led to a lot of further action and interrogation of what was going on were asked, but were not answered sufficiently. And today, of course, I reflect a lot on what we did uh, four years ago and whether we did enough and whether we, we raised the alarm enough, but it wouldn't be the first time this was being missed. So in several incidents from 58 when we found the first cases of this disease in monkeys and that's why it had uh, got the name from 1970 and several small incidents. Uh, 1970 was when we found the first case in humans in Zaire, a country now called Democratic Republic of Congo and multiple events afterwards. There were many, we had many opportunities. A very interesting outbreak in 2003 in 47 people in the US that was linked to pariah dogs who themselves uh, were thought to have uh, got the infection from an animal that they were uh, located with together after importation into the US. Uh, to the outbreak in Nigeria and now what is happening, we've had multiple opportunities multiple opportunities to learn these lessons, but for some reason, we were not able to. And the question is why? And I think one of the challenges that we've had is how do we link our work, our traditional work in national public health institutes to the expertise that studies animals and understands the ecosystems between animals and humans, uh, to human behavior and how that affects transmission, mobility, behavior, all these sciences are almost working in parallel and we don't have enough opportunities to bring them together to understand the important lessons that we need to understand to, under, to, to make sense of what is happening um, with an outbreak like this. And today we're paying a price, over 5,000 confirmed cases and we don't yet know where this outbreak is going to. The question therefore is how often do we have to learn the same lessons and when do we start doing something finally about these? The, the second number I'd like to reflect on with you is 4,500. 4,500 are the number of signals detected and investigated every month across the World Health Organization, our HQ and our regional offices. Every single one of these can be the beginning of a new pandemic. And none of us knows which one it is. So we, we have to address, confront each of them as if it's the beginning of something new. How do you do that? You do a risk assessment. We do this every day. Sometimes we do it, sometimes we do it informally, sometimes we do it formally, the process of doing that, but to do that, you really have to understand the context because context matters so much in our work. Context is what enables you jump up when you get a piece of information and start working immediately or what allows you to leave it to the next morning. And whenever we think about epidemic risks, we have to remember that the word radar has been used a lot. And when you, when you imagine a radar, you imagine a system that detects a risk that is progressive in a, in a predictable way. And that radar can find that signal and determine the response. But our work in epidemic risk is closer to the image on, on my extreme left, where it's almost impossible to predict out of every signal found every single day, and all of us working in this space will recognize this. It's very, it's almost impossible to predict which one will become a big uh, outbreak uh, pandemic if you don't understand the context. So context matters so much. Context is what differentiates when you have a case of meningitis, measles, cholera, 
in an adult or in a child, in a rural area, in a refugee camp, in a patient with immunocom uh, that is immunocompromised for one reason or the other. It is that context that then determines your action, your ability to understand the risk and therefore what you will do. And so if you don't have that contextual information and if you're not able to synthesize that in a systematic way into your own decision making, then we keep counting the numbers after events have happened. And this is really what needs to change in the work um, that we do. The third and final number I thought to reflect on you with is one I hope everyone in the room recognizes. This is the estimate, WHO's official estimate of the excess mortality related to COVID, the number of people that have passed away from this infection that would not have passed away if we did not have the pandemic. You might argue on the edges, on the accuracy in different geographies, but that's beside the point today. The key thing is we've lost a lot of people. And if this number on its own doesn't bring some level of humility, most people in this room would have no one person or the other personally or through your family that has passed away or that has been severely affected by this. I definitely cannot get off my mind. A guy I went to school with, spent six years in boarding school with, he died in the first three months of the pandemic. Last Saturday was his memorial service in Nigeria. And I remember, even as the director of NCDC, how we were looking around Lagos to get the oxygen supplies that he needed to uh, sustain him in the hospital where he was. So we cannot come out of this pandemic and not respond and go back to business as usual and continue working the way we have and hope that somehow uh, things will improve on their own. So in summary, um, what are we proposing for the future? That we, we recognize that the work that we're doing and that we have to do is hard and will be hard. And that there, there are no simple answers. If there were simple answers, we would have found this many years ago. But having a hard problem doesn't mean that we should give up on it. So we've got to be intentional and focused on this difficult challenge that we're facing. Um, assessing the risks and understanding what we need to do will require us to be a little bit vulnerable vulnerable in leaving the spaces that we are comfortable in and accepting that there are many disciplines that will enable us get better at our work. And unless we embrace this multidisciplinary nature of our work and really do so, not only say it, that we will not end up in a better place. And finally, while national strategies are important, they are not sufficient in the world of infectious diseases. So we have to work across um, countries. And working across countries means that we have to get better at, at dealing and with the challenges that face us. And the evidence is that the circumstances that will lead to transmission, uh, the emergence, transmission, and sustenance of infectious diseases are leading to an easier transmission and the easier uh, perpetuation of these uh, outbreaks and pandemics. And these are a few images. This is from uh, a, a, a pictorial uh, pictures from the a few plagues in the second, third, and sixth century. And then the impact of the initial European colonization and the spread of measles, smallpox around the world to the transatlantic slave trade and the impact that had on falciparum malaria and the, also the impact malaria had on the transatlantic slave trade. And finally, at least for this graphic, in 2000, at the beginning of my career here in Germany at the Robert Koch Institute, we were faced with the first SARS outbreak. And I remember that I was at the bottom of the food chain, not really involved in the response at the time, but I had a front seat uh, opportunity to watch my colleagues respond to this outbreak and really think and talk and imagine how this spread around the world and we thought that listen this might uh, there was a, a good response to it eventually despite the loss of lives but we also watched here and in many other countries the way the response to this outbreak of SARS was almost packed as an exceptional event and uh, one that 
was unlikely to happen again. So I haven't included uh, any image of the current outbreak because firstly, it's still ongoing, and secondly, you've probably seen enough of them uh, to show you more to make any sense. So in conclusion, working across disciplines is what we have to do in order to get to where we need to get to. Uh, this really means thinking about the disciplines we need to work with every single day and not the people we invite for events once a month or once a year. It really means integrating and being open to other ideas, influences in how we think and work. It also means working better across levels, from local to regional to national, and accepting that each of those levels are dependent on the other level working well for the other levels to work efficiently. You can't have a good national service if you don't have a good local one. And you, we can't have a good global health intelligence hub in Berlin if we don't have countries working well, if we don't have the regions working well. So what we're trying to create in a way is not just a hub in Berlin, but it's an ecosystem that involves every country in the world, every region, uh, to really think about how the, the work that we're doing will be evolving. So where do we end up? At the last World Health Assembly in Geneva, uh, the Director General offered the world a vision for the future around health emergency preparedness, response, and resilience. It's called the new architecture for health emergencies. In that, there were five areas articulated uh, for focused intervention. And a new term that's emerging that was used is something called collaborative surveillance. Um, there's an exciting process going on in the division at the moment, in the hub, to define the dimensions of what collaborative surveillance actually means and offer this new vision to the world so that we can mobilize ourselves around this vision. You would have seen this term used in the new pact uh, that was uh, articulated at the G7 meeting. So this term, uh, that just held in Berlin, you see this term increasingly being used. But what does it really mean? And what changes do we have to make in the work that we are doing to bring this change to life? And that's really what we're going to do over the next few months and offer that new vision in the work that we are doing ourselves in the way we are designing our own team to reflect the skills needed uh, to do the work that we need to do and then hopefully offer every national public health agency, every regional public health agency, and their collaborators in the national spaces and in the spaces that they work in, a, a vision of how to do this work that we have to do in order to then get better at it. Um, to be honest, um, sometimes it does feel like a mission impossible, and, and very often, we do get challenged by many people and uh, saying, this is, um, you know, this is a hard task. But it's one that we have to attempt to do. And, and that's really the journey that has started in Berlin. And, and I hope that all of us in the room will join us on that journey. And to segue into the next part of this evening, which is the most important uh, uh, part, actually. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Marion Koopmans. Nobody probably uh, illustrates this intersection better than Marion, uh, both trained as a microbiologist and a vet uh, that has worked in academia, in public health, in the US, in Europe, in different parts of the world. So several intersections in profession, in geography. Uh, she now leads the viral science department in the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. She is the coordinator of the Versatile Emerging Infectious Diseases Observatory, uh, a large EU-funded uh, project, and is also the director of the WHO uh, Collaborating Center on Emerging Infectious Diseases. Marion, we're, we're lucky to have you this evening. Uh, and look forward to, 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 to hearing your, your story, but also your view of how we can get this difficult context working. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and for your vision for this uh, challenging task, but very inspiring collaborative surveillance. And what I will do is share with you some of the attempts that, that we are trying to do with our European consortium. And I stress these are attempts because this is a challenging task, uh, but I will walk with you through some of our thinking here. As uh, Chikwa said, I'm a veterinarian, and walking into this room, I saw images, I cannot get them out of my head, with my uh, history in studying viral gastroenteritis of the power of vomit <laughs> coming from a dinosaur that high up, uh, and uh, it was projected to be lethal. But being a veterinarian, I thought, no, that cannot be possible. These are ruminants and they cannot vomit. So rest assured, you're safe here. Um, so what I would like to talk you through is uh, indeed this concept of embracing complexity and here uh, asking attention for the much used one health term, but in the new definition that was uh, recently put together and adopted by the, the four organizations, FAO, WHO, the, anim the WHO for Animals, and the uh, U United Nations Environmental Program. And that is, let's step away from our focus on humans uh, as uh, the center of all attention to uh, a, a, a way of thinking where we, as, where we acknowledge that the health of humans, animals, and the environment are tightly linked and therefore need to be really studied and appreciated in conjunction, the One Health uh, approach. And we've seen how important that is just uh, played out during this pandemic. Um, we, ha we are looking at yet another example of a virus that spilled over from animals. We think bats, it's not yet completely settled what the trajectory was, um, but uh, certainly uh, spillover and then from there global spread, uh, explosive spread I might say of this disease with the fatality number that was just mentioned but also um, spill back of this virus into many other animals. Seen on the top left, natural infections in many of the animals that share our world that we then contaminated with our viruses and that picked them up uh, the viruses started to circulate, for instance in mink, in white-tailed uh, deer, uh, started to accumulate mutations and were transmitted back to humans again. So this is an example of the connectedness of the cycles of uh, humans, animals and the environment and the viruses that we share uh, between those. Lots of uh, other animals uh, experimentally infected, unfortunately also some that are not uh, uh, impacted. And it is also important to zoom out a little bit. Yes, we have been extremely busy and preoccupied for good reasons with this pandemic, but the world hasn't been silent if you look at the animal world. And this is an image of notifications to the FAO, um, the Empress Eye database that FAO has, um, and showing the many cases of African swine fever, a disease that is very uh, uh, transmissible among pigs. It causes severe disease and it is controlled by culling pig herds. And uh, right as we speak, there is African swine fever outbreaks also here in Germany, and the way to control them is to really eliminate uh, herds. A very um, important epizootic disease, not zoonotic, but big impact in the animal world. And that of course also has impact because animals are produced also for our food. And what happened here is an example. Um, so at the top, the globes, you see how this virus expanded over the world and hit particularly hard in uh, Asia and China, which uh, in middle of 2019 really led to a steep increase in the price of pork meat. And in this particular publication, 
these authors put forward the hypothesis that maybe this has been one of the drivers of the pandemic by um, chasing people away from buying pork meat and maybe uh, driving them to finding other meat, including potentially wild mammals. Hypothesis, not proven, but uh, it is an example of the kinds of mechanisms that may actually uh, play a role. And here is yet another animal disease. Um, and what um, some of you may and others may not realize is that we have had a second pandemic over the past years. And that is that of what happened with avian influenza of a subtype that we used to know from the uh, 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 Asian region, particularly southern China, where it has been circulating in poultry and where China has managed to really control its circulation through uh, vaccination programs, but um, it was not completely contained and from there this virus has started to swarm around the world. Initially for a couple of years being introduced occasionally into Europe but in the past few years now, completely established in Europe, where we see now continued evolution of this virus um, in wild bird populations uh, across Europe. And just last year, the virus also made a jump across the Atlantic and now is spreading uh, across the Americas. And the expectation is that it's going to be established there as well. Incredible, uh, incredible event, unprecedented event, but happening in wild birds. Um, so we now have global circulation of a virus that we have on our potential pandemic threat list. That's a serious event in my view. So um, what this shows is that um, our world is definitely not static. Our ver world is very much changing and what we see is the end result is uh, when people start ge getting sick. But that's really the tip of the pyramid and uh, focusing on disease surveillance by detecting the people that are sick, that report to the healthcare system is right quite late. So what we're trying to do with our um, consortium is think through, could we get ahead of that game by thinking about the factors that actually uh, increase the risk of outbreaks. Could we do that by focusing on information that tells you about drivers of disease outbreaks? And I will try to explain how we do that. And that also means that we are focusing on um, factors that are at play in the ecosystems where the viruses that, that may cause zoonotic uh, disease outbreaks are circulating. What is going on there and can we pick up important change there before people are getting sick? High level ambition may definitely not be possible, but we do want to try this. So what we are doing here is bring together people from different disciplines, uh, uh, a wide range of fields uh, to think through a disease emergence scenarios. These are the ones that we have chosen. For instance, think about a new vector-borne disease emergence across Europe, a zoonotic wildlife-borne disease, or a climate change scenario. And of course, all of that eventually needs to lead to our preparedness for any uh, emerging disease, the disease X scenario. And what we do then is put together the biologists, veterinarians, the public health specialists, the uh, clinicians, data scientists, uh, people that know about uh, data infrastructure, uh, many, many, many different uh, uh, areas of expertise and say for your particular scenario, let's say vector-borne, what are the key drivers, you think? What are the factors that really change the risk of um, vector-borne disease outbreaks. Is there data around that you could use to, to see if anything is happening there? And what is the quality of that data? And then, of course, can we somehow pull that together to inform us about uh, 
raising flags for potential outbreaks. Um, and this is you can um, you can think you can all think of types of data. We have the traditional surveillance data, laboratory data, epi data, some clinical data, but it's also information about animal movement. It's about population density. It's about climate uh, change. It's about deforestation. That kind of information that tells you something is happening in a certain ecosystem. And if things change, then you also have to be thinking about what that does to the possible uh, exchange of uh, viruses in such a system. Now, here's one of our examples. So we work with case studies. And this is a case study in uh, my country, the Netherlands, which is a delta, as you know. Uh, so quite wet and uh, low-lying in a region that where the temperatures are rising pretty fast and where we are um, uh, preparing for sea level rise. So as of 2023, all the cities in our, in our country have been asked to think about nature-based solutions to be able to accommodate more water and more extremes of, uh, of rainfall and drought and salinization. So big changes in the ecology. And there is people from the uh, landscaping uh, and agricultural field and the technology field that are actually designing these solutions. They do not only do that in uh, the Netherlands, but also in other important uh, delta regions across the globe that have similar problems coming their way and that also are equally uh, densely uh, populated. I think my pointer is not working. Can you see if the, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's there. So equally densely populated. So low-lying deltas under pressure of sea level rise with temperature change and highly densely populated. So what we're looking at is uh, what else could, uh, so if you're now looking at these landscaping solutions, what could that do to the ecology that we're looking at? This doesn't work. Can you maybe? Yeah, thank you. So. Of course, deltas are also very important for birds, for migratory birds, and are places where these birds rest, feed, mix. Uh, so what we see is that we have delta regions where um, there is convening um, convergence of flyways uh, with uh, high densities of animals. Uh, and what is clear that if you uh, add big wadis, for instance, to an urban region that may actually change some of this ecology of uh, bird flyways. That's, that also happens if you look at um, uh, high density urban areas, because here, for instance, the, the gulls that are part of a tracking program are clearly attracted by urban wastewater treatment centers. So, so they converge there as well. Or places, the bottom right, a um, uh, uh, market hall where there is a lot of leftover food where birds come to feed. And you see in the colors that there's different types of birds that in their natural habitats do not mix, but mix in this uh, urban uh, food environment. So we disturb the ecology. That's the message here. So what you then can do is try and combine this type of data into and see if there's patterns to be seen. And what you're looking at here now is uh, the movement of uh, a certain type of viruses, arboviruses that are called West Nile, that is, co that is transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, and what we're looking at is using molecular data, so the virus genes, genomes, to try and see how these viruses move through Europe. And then combining that with data, for instance, about uh, bird flyways to see if we can understand what actually makes them move upward. Because that is then information 
that we could use for surveillance. Now, if you do that kind of thing, you always see there's data missing, and that's uh, a common theme with people that work with data. The data is never perfect. There's always gaps in data. Um, and what we are now exploring is, can we turn that around and say, let's see what we can collect. And here's one of the examples that is uh, apps that collect uh, pictures from mosquitoes um, that uh, ask people to uh, report uh, if they have been bitten, if they see mosquito breeding sites, and they can also ship a mosquito if they're really curious about what it is, and then we're happy to test them. So this is done, uh, translated in 19 languages, and has been used uh, across uh, Europe uh, just to uh, explore how this would work. And what you, you can see is now notifications by citizens of different mosquitoes, and you now see a school program that also played with that and reported lots and lots of mosquitoes for a certain amount of time. So this is a new type of data that is not structures, is not, we don't know how to really work with it, but it is out there and it is uh, informative and it is the kind of data that she needs to figure out how to work with. Um, so what is also really important in this whole uh, arena is, of course, there's lots of data, but it needs to be shared to be useful for these kinds of purposes. Um, and this is an example from the Mosquito uh, Project. So all the images of those mosquitoes are now in a bioimage, and other people can just explore it and have used it for machine learning to try and learn how to recognize certain mosquito species from images. Very interesting uh, reuse of data and also useful for, for further um, use. Okay, now back to our, um, the problem that I definitely am worried about and that's avian influenza. Uh, so this is the notifications for just the past few uh, months. Um, still very active uh, problem, of course, and there's this big area north in Greenland where no uh, notifications are there. That's also because very few people live there, uh, but whereas, which is also very rapidly thawing because of the climate uh, progression and the northward movement of the permafrost, and that's why there's also now uh, an expedition trying to figure out what is exactly going on there. I'm, I'm having struggle with this thing here. Yeah. So it is trying to map what does this ecosystem look like now and uh, how is this going to change with this northward movement of the permafrost when there's uh, much more o opportunity now for these uh, migratory birds that again could lead to shifts in their um, uh, ecology. So um, I'm getting to the end, important, critically important is mechanisms to share the data. And that's one of the struggles um, because we do realize, many people realize that, but there's also barriers. For instance, South Africa did a marvelous job in generating sequence data on Omicron, but then got a flight ban, tourist uh, uh, <laughs> lockdown. So that's um, not helping, uh, and we really have to figure out how to share these data without those kinds of consequences. And very important, and that's going to be a very uh, crucial task, I think, for the hub is, um, now, if you do sig sig see signals, then what? If we look at the avian influenza situation, We've seen this global dispersal, now what? Are we going to go to a higher level of alert and what are the mechanisms there going to be? So um, with that, I, am, I think that's a lot on your shoulders, but it is an exciting and important area moving forward. Thank you very much, Marion, for outlining uh, the complexity uh, of the issues. 
this uh, presentation, I think, also showed you and explained to you what these dots actually mean in uh, the uh, logo of, uh, of the hub. Uh, of course, you know, normally when you can show that and see how dynamic it is, and again, Marion highlighted the dynamics of it all. But I must say, as a social scientist, I was uh, intrigued by what you put forward because in exactly the same way we argue about the social determinants of health. And I think it would be really, really intriguing to take your arguments also of the drivers and the many different dimensions, some of which, like the economics, are actually similar to what we're trying to sort out around equity and these issues. And on the other hand, you know, relate that uh, to some of the ecological and uh, other issues that you have raised. So some of the experiences from the social sciences trying to deal with the complexity of the determinants of health, linking that to what you have outlined, I think is maybe also something that we can take up in one of these discussions uh, as we move forward. Now we felt we shouldn't only have voices in the room, uh, but actually invite some voices from around the world. Uh, and you will see a diversity of voices from different continents, from different uh, disciplines again, uh, who will uh, just outline what uh, the, the challenges are that they are facing and where to some extent they are hoping uh, like you had on that very last slide, that uh, the hub uh, will provide uh, some uh, ways to move forward on these challenges. Could we uh, have the video, please? I am Gyanendra Gongal, Senior Public Health Officer, W3 Regional Office of Southeast Asia, New Delhi. It is my great pleasure to share thoughts on complexity of pandemics. My name is Michael Foss and I am the Managing Director of the newly founded think tank Center for Planetary Health Policy in Berlin, Germany. My name is Mishek Mulumba, the Senior Manager responsible for animal health in the Agriculture Research Council's On the Steput Veterinary Institute in Pretoria, South Africa. I'm also the current chairperson of the Africa One Health Network. Hello, my name is Nicole Redvers and I'm a member of the Deninukwe First Nation located in subarctic Canada. I'm also an Indigenous scholar working to bridge Western and Indigenous ways of knowing as it pertains to individual, community and planetary health. I'm Heba Mahrous. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist working as a One Health Technical Officer at the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office for the World Health Organization. The emergence of zoonotic pathogen that passes into human population from an animal source directly or through intermediary species is a matter of public health concern in the light of globalization of travel and trade. Being a world reference laboratory for several diseases, our work normally revolves around diagnostics and research in different diseases and disease conditions. The projects that we run usually have multidisciplinary aspects that look to address a specific area of concern through a combination of different methods. We also have to consider if the pathogen we are dealing with is zoonotic or has zoonotic potential. 75% of emerging infectious diseases in last three decades are of animal origin. The emergence of novel pathogen in any part of the world may become a threat to global health security. One Health is a multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary approach. In fact, it's the way out. No doubt that the environment and the environmental changes play a vital role in transmitting those threats 
among animals and humans. The concept of planetary health describes the interrelationships and interdependencies among human health and animal health as well as the health of the ecosystem and encompasses a transdisciplinary understanding of the influences and conditions for health. With the new Center for Planetary Health Policy, we want to make a decisive contribution to sustainably anchor health equity, climate neutrality and resilience in the health sector, making it a model for other sectors and as well for other health systems in the world. If I look at disease examples which are complex, I could choose heart water, foot and mouth disease, rabies and highly pathogenic influenza. In terms of highly pathogenic influenza, we know that wild birds play a huge role in the spread, as does the environment itself. So surveillance samples from wild birds and environmental samples from high-risk areas are routinely tested in our lab. And in this regard, we collaborate very closely with our colleagues in human and planetary health to detect the disease so that surveillance in humans on poultry farms can commence immediately. We need to stop the narrative of aligning so-called separate sectors such as human, animal, and planetary health, but instead seek to better focus, describe, and operationalize instead the interconnectedness between systems with a focus on relationships instead of variables alone. We need to have the basic communication skills to be able to bring everyone on board to be able to provide support to countries, to open communication channels among different disciplines, different sectors. Let them come together, let them be on board, discussing their challenges, proposing joint solutions to all health threats at the human-animal environment interface. Utilizing the One Health platforms already established in various parts of the world, can be useful in collecting information on the various law players active in the field and also the areas of collaboration can be identified. We need more indigenous presence and more indigenous voices amplifying and leading through thought experiments and real-time implementations of solutions on the ground. We have got enough wake-up calls in the last two decades and it is time to act by establishing a robust real-time surveillance system as a part of health security, health uh, emergency preparedness and response. It has become apparent that society cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created them in the first place, as it will continue to perpetuate a disconnect between us and the planet as relatives. We at the Center for Planetary Health Policy look forward to be working with you and the WHO Hub on integrating health and climate and environmental data to inform policymakers on co-benefit policymaking that serves human and animal health as well as the environment. Together we can, using the One Health approach. Thank you to those voices who also reinforced uh, many of the issues that were raised both by Chikwe and Marian. Chikwe and Marian, I'd like to ask you to come up on a stage again for a bit of a discussion. As always uh, in these events, uh, we are taking more time than we had planned. Uh, so uh, bear with us. Uh, there was the great intention of uh, also answering a set of uh, questions uh, from the audience and for that uh, we had made a tool available uh, to you uh, those that are in the room there's a qr code here those that are at home were sent such a, a tool uh, if you do have some questions do send them or some comments even even more importantly maybe than the questions at this stage or any offers of cooperation what you could offer to the hub would be very welcome. Everything that will be sent in uh, will be uh, screened and looked at uh, by the Hub, and uh, I'm sure a whole number of uh, great ideas will emerge from that. We'll start a discussion here. Uh, the team uh, from the Hub is going to select a question or two that uh, we will uh, sort of weave in. Importantly, you can uh, vote up questions 
So please also make use of that uh, possibility because then we can see what sort of uh, on the group mind uh, that uh, is uh, a question maybe you can answer or a comment uh, you can relate to. As we've heard, we can't answer every question yet, but uh, we want to find the right process, the right way to move ahead uh, to be uh, able to do that. And so uh, for a start, uh, both uh, Chikwe and Marian, uh, what came particularly also from uh, those short video statements was the consistent call for uh, a dialogue with policymakers, the need for real-time data to make it, in quotes, easier to take decisions. Whether that's true uh, is another question. Uh, or, you know, maybe real-time data put you under such pressure that the decisions are not necessarily better decisions. Uh, so um, all this complexity, and I alluded to it, I know it a bit from my own work, uh, that uh, when, you, when you show these complexities, uh, people say, how can you take a decision based on that? So how do you have that dialogue with policymakers? Or I actually prefer that dialogue with politicians because policymakers, I think, are closer, whereas politicians are really under pressure to act and are watched very closely by the media, by the public. Marian, would you uh, take uh, a first stab at that? Um, yes, yeah, so that's where I think the, the, the dialogue is easier once you really have a human disease situation or a se severe animal disease situation because then uh, things are hitting home um, and uh, of course there's there's many uh, issues with with doing that right uh, as well but I think we are really um, in need for ways to communicate this this more forward thinking how do we actually do that so and 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 uh, because it is eventually hopefully investing in what might approach prevention or at least early detection so early that you don't go mm. into these massive outbreaks. That would be the ideal scenario. But that's not very popular, particularly not with politicians, because it is uh, preparing for something that may never happen. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's asking to invest money in something that may never happen. And that's notoriously difficult. So I think that's an area that we really need to invest in, um, uh, how to do that. Maybe also talking with econ economists that can help do that. Uh, uh, it, it is in my country, we've had the, uh, the history that this, for some reason, uh, did work when we had one huge flood in the 50s. And that triggered a massive investment in flood preparedness programs for which the Netherlands now is, is internationally well known because of an investment mm. with one event. Well, if, if that's something we can bring across to uh, our politicians, I think that would be something to take on. Maybe okay, that's a very interesting example. Chikwe, anything you want to add there? Yeah, well, just a few reflections. You know, I shared the numbers of excess mortality, but um, maybe that's not the numbers most politicians want to see, right? If, if by the time we get to studying uh, the, the economic impact of, of this, uh, the impact on society, uh, and maybe that would then tell a story. I don't think, uh, I think in the last couple of years, we've all had the ears of our political leaders m more than ever before. Uh, many people working in the jobs that we are working in maybe would never have been known by the political leadership of our countries. But now uh, our political leaders know who the heads of their national agencies are, they know who the major scientists are in their spaces. So th the challenge for us is how to leverage that and make sure that um, when things do quieten down a bit, which we all hope that they do, that we don't lose that opportunity of influencing uh, their thought processes and their decision making. A and when we think about training and developing ourselves, I think we also have a responsibility to train our leaders 
um, in understanding the work that we do and the impact of the decisions that they make, not only on, on human and animal health, but on our, our economies, our way of life, and our, our future. So I, I think this is difficult because, you know, in many countries in the world, there are competing priorities uh, everywhere. If you look at even Europe, where we live in at the moment, a few months ago we, we were focusing on the pandemic. Right now, you know, we've all been distracted by a, a terrible war going on a, a few kilometers away. So the, the attention span has almost left, and we have to find ways of keeping the focus on what we have to do now and into the future to learn the important lessons from, from this pandemic. Thank you. Now, uh, Marian, uh, you described your research group and the kind of things that you do. Um, how does one get that kind of research funded? Because if I look you know, at a lot of uh, uh, funding agencies, also public uh, funding agencies, maybe also EU funding agencies, I understand you're funded by the EU, um, what, uh, you know, how does one transcend uh, that those funding streams that also tend to be very, very uh, disciplinary, if I can call it that, and uh, uh, what is your experience and how do you think uh, one can build an alliance also of researchers who want to do this kind of one health research to actually be able to have the adequate funding to take it forward? Um, yes, I wouldn't say adequate, but uh, <laughs> but uh, so uh, actually there are increasingly funding schemes that that look into complexity. Uh, so I, I do think we have seen a shift over the yeah. past uh, decade, maybe, um, and uh, so certainly in Europe that has happened, uh, um, and then it's really about getting a group together around a story that really comes across with tangible and and you know measurable uh, research studies and that's the hardest part so for any of the so we've had a couple of projects in a row now but for each of them we've had many discussions many brainstorms you know tough debates on what exactly is it that we're trying to do and i think that's a really important part of trying to move this agenda because we come from very different worlds mm. uh, and it takes a long time before you have some understanding of what, what makes the other mm. uh, discipline tick. And uh, so, so that investing in that to me is, is really important. But I do think the funding is also part of the problem because funding schemes are short-lived. Um, so we may find ourselves into a nice consortium and, and I've been fortunate uh, to be granted some of that, but then the next round you may be again competitors and that's really, really, um, it's the way how, uh, it's how it works, but it's certainly not helping to build this longer term change agenda. And uh, so, yeah, I think we do have to figure out ways of doing that differently. Chikwe, how does that play out then in uh, countries of the Global South where anyhow, you know, there is a difficulty with funding research in many cases? And uh, if I can add already to that, uh, are there things we can learn from uh, other areas? I mean, there has been a discussion that uh, one should actually use the model of the IPCC uh, to bring together all the uh, research in, you know, with groups all around the world in relation uh, to pandemics. Uh, how does one make this kind of research really global is, uh, is really my question. Yeah, I, I think this is really uh, a, a big challenge and an opportunity because, you know, the, this pandemic demonstrates how global the world is and actually uh, you can see the, the parts of the world that were most affected, unfortunately, might not be the parts you would have predicted would have been most affected at the beginning. So we have to see this as a global challenge and, and not within the small countries in how we organize ourselves and then be more intentional in, in, in defining how research that is funded with public funds leads to public benefit. 
And I, 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 I just don't think there's enough intentionality that goes into the translation of results like output of the important work that consortia like the one uh, Marion leads. It's not clear how that then leads to action and changes in policy. And we focus a lot on, on more data, better science and all of that, but not enough in the translation of that into policy and action. And I think that's uh, an important space that we hope to be able to do more work on. Um, we see the hub not only as an opportunity to improve uh, data collection and analysis, but really as the third part of that is how to support better decision making. And that is probably the hardest part because it's the part that we're most, we're least comfortable with in terms of uh, that flow. And uh, I, I think countries in the global south have, have borne a great burden in this pandemic, even in countries where the number of cases might not have been as high the economic impact has been incredible because of the pandemic. And there's a lot of focus on this now, but I think the real challenge is how we see the world we live in as, as a global community. And even if you look at the current efforts on the current problem around monkeypox, you see the same challenges that happened with COVID. Many very similar uh, knee-jerk reactions. You see, countries arranging purchase agreements for vaccines, bidding against each other in who can procure first, who can procure more quickly, how can I support the small group of people that I have responsibility for as a politician. And until we can find mechanisms to address this as the global problems there are, we will continue chasing our tails on this. So this is really something that we hope to highlight I know um, equity of access is uh, something very important to the leadership of the World Health Organization and it's something that we collectively have to also put energy on and not just focus on the technical aspects of our work which we tend to be more comfortable with but also the political societal uh, outcomes uh, and aspects of the work that we do. Thank you for that and I'll uh, go to the questions that have come in in a minute but uh, Marion, uh, one of the elements is we've talked about, you know, how do we get this message of complexity uh, to politicians, but of course uh, there's people out there, there's sure. the community, there's the citizens. How do we explain, and there's been, you know, so much uh, discussion around the role of science, can we believe science, uh, why do scientists change their mind every second day? Mm. Um, so uh, how does one get that message of complexity, but even more so that message when there is a new phenomenon of uncertainty, how does one communicate that and to what extent uh, or how in terms of research also, and is it part of what you do? Do you think about how you will communicate your message? Um, yes, well, that's a big question, and I'm not pretending to know <laughs> how, but uh, I think it's, it's crucial, and it's a very uh, demanding role, and I think it's something that uh, scientists today really need to pick up. Um, I uh, strongly believe this also starts with, for instance, schools um, and citizens, so in our projects we do engage schools, mm -hmm. citizens, um, neighborhoods, in, uh, in, in projects um, because it, it, it really is a long-term uh, thing. We've seen a lot of uh, challenge of science, but on the other hand, also trust in science, both uh, parts of the spectrum. And what I personally find n not, not so easy is how in that polarized debate do you actually step in and find the common ground again. I think that's the type of uh, discussions and, and, and maybe even projects that we have to start uh, looking into because it is um, complexity is, uh, is complex. If I look at the, 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 the consortium that we now have, it took around 12 years to get to where we now are with 
uh, different groups of people and to have somewhat of a common language. It takes, it's, it's, it's work, <laughs> it's work. Yes, yeah, so it's definitely something that, you know, as we research, we continuously in this field have to think about how do we communicate that research, mm -hmm. and not only policymakers, uh, uh, politicians, not only other disciplines, but of course also citizens and uh, populations. Now, Chick, we're often as one discusses about all these things, there is uh, a sort of wish for prediction. You know, how much al do these data allow us to predict something? And interestingly enough, one of the questions we got is also about prediction. What is the health threat that you believe has the biggest potential to cause large human or animal impact in the coming five years? I know from the GPMB, when we uh, issued our report in 2019, we spoke about a flu-like event. Uh, so, and we were wrong. Uh, uh, we were right that an event was around the corner. Uh, but uh, what, what do you think? Uh, is this a question one needs to think about, a question one needs to answer? How does one warn? You refer to that a little bit. You know, I'm looking at your, your birds. Uh, say, how does one warn? How, you know, and uh, to what extent should one warn and make people nervous all the time? You know, there's... Uh, what is it, 4,500 events, you know, you'd better be aware of them. Uh, so can you say something about that? Is there any kind of prediction we can do in this context? Um, I think the whole idea of prediction and forecasting is obviously very, a very, you know, interesting space. I, I wouldn't predict what the next one <laughs> will be by any means, but I do know that what the work that we're doing that we hope to be able to do in the hub with countries around the world will enable us to better understand the risks that we face and you know and and those risks uh some of them we have to uh, accept in our in the work we do are stochastic there's a lot of chance plays a big role in, in the emergence of infectious diseases and we we understand that accept that but in a way even when outbreaks do happen. There's a saying, I have to see whether I can get the word uh, right, that outbreaks are on, sometimes you can't prevent outbreaks, but we can definitely, most of the time, potentially prevent pandemics if we prepare enough to detect, understand the risk factors and are able to uh, respond to them. And in a way, to be honest, Ilona, um, a lot of work is going on on these aspects around the world, right? If I think about the expansion of the uh, digital infrastructure to better understand what is going on, if I look at the expansion of laboratory infrastructure around the world, um, we have some colleagues from Brazil here. We were in Brazil a few months ago myself, and, and just to uh, learn about how much they are expanding the work they are doing across South America. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, part of our team was in Singapore, uh, learned about the work happening there and the expansion there. Um, you know, it leaves me with a lot of hope uh, in, in the space that we work in, in terms of the investments going on by different parts of the world in, in, the, in improving the ability to detect events. The big challenge, I think, is the one you referred to earlier, actually. Is, and and uh, Marion referred to this too in her examples on avian influenza is when these signals are detected, how intentional are we in responding to them? Uh, how do we get better in assessing which of them might potentially become significant? And how do we educate our political leaderships around the decisions they make uh, in response to them? Thank you. Uh, both of you uh, referred to the need to share, uh, to share research, to share knowledge, to share data. And uh, there's uh, also a question here that uh, asks, how important do you see linking the sharing of benefits with the intensified data sharing that is required for your work? And uh, there's obviously also a reference to the Nagoya Protocol. 
uh, etc. Marion, could you say a bit about that, about that need to share and to share data, to share benefits? We're more used to extraction of data and uh, to some extent, you know, some of the colonial practices that we have in global health, you referred to them, uh, Chikwe, you referred to the South Africa uh, example. So uh, how does one, do we need new rules, new standards? Uh, should, you know, the new pandemic treaty take care of that? How does one take that forward? Because we're not really willing to share neither vaccines nor data nor anything else. Yeah, so I think it, it is uh, it's critically important. It's part of, I mean, we can dream of global surveillance, but if we cannot share, then what is the use, <laughs> essentially? So it is critically important, and I do think the Nagoya Protocol has put an important point on the table that you really have to think about. It's not just you wanting data, but there's also uh, uh, something you have to think about, what that data, you know, who generated it, what if you get something out of that, how does that benefit get shared? So I think that's good. I do think we have to um, have a lot of discussion there because the there is a risk that now this becomes almost like uh, data becomes a commodity. And that's, uh, that, that would be, you know, also not, not uh, good. Um, uh, and there is a lot of work that is ongoing on what are the barriers. There is in, in part just simple technical barriers. It's not that easy to share data. Uh, there is uh, people, we talked about the uh, funding schemes and, and scientists need to, uh, you know, they, they get judged by their publications that may be a barrier to, to da mm -hmm. uh, sharing data. The same happens in public health organizations. People are you know, uh, awarded based on their publications in some uh, regions. So there's those kinds of things that we need to better understand. Um, uh, and, and I think it's a question of, of continuing to work. What I do uh, worry about, and I think should be very, very strong positions against, is the, the use of data in war rhetoric. We've seen that, we've seen that now in um, the, uh, there was a UN Security Council meeting specially called that mentioned uh, uh, you know, lab programs and they showed uh, work on avian influenza surveillance program as if that was an evil thing that was happening in Ukrainian labs. I think that's really, really detrimental because that could d really damage our ability to share data globally. Thank you and I'd like to uh move on from that to, to you, Chikwe. First of all, because of this increasing uh, war rhetoric, because also of all the experiences in the digital transformation, the term surveillance has started to get quite a negative connotation, even if we call it collaborative surveillance. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're being surveyed all the time. And uh, you have Facebook surveillance, you have all kinds of things, and you have data extraction. Not, uh, not data sharing. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing that you know, data are becoming, and health data in particular, one of the most valuable uh, things uh, that uh, you can have access to. And they're being subject to uh, geopolitical um, competition. You know, who builds uh, the uh, digital connectivity in Senegal, for example? And, uh, um, you know, and can we rest assured that if we have four different internets and systems, that they will all share their data with the World Health Organization and the hub? <laughs> <laughs> can you please solve that? Uh, <laughs> you, you didn't ask me to ask easy questions, did you? No, you know, you know this data sharing, discussion always is a tough one, right? And uh, right now it's a particularly difficult time to have that conversation. And uh, in a way, sometimes we need to leave our space. So we were in a, a meeting like this uh, not too long ago and having a very in-depth conversation about how difficult it was to share data. It was, you know, the colleague in the room, he was the Minister of Health, 
for Indonesia. Uh, interestingly, he has a finance background, so he wasn't a medical, uh, non, in none of the medical fields. So he shared with us the experience of the financial sector and, and how much uh, countries, uh, independent central banks in countries actually share with each other in order to maintain and sustain financial transactions around the world. A and in real depth, because this is an area he grew up in. And he, he shared also the processes, the years it took to come up with the frameworks that allow that sharing to happen without taking away from the sovereign responsibilities and opportunities of each country. Because they understood that while it is important for the financial institutions in each country to be strong and stable, we also need a global financial uh, architecture for, for the world to survive. And each country's survival was interdependent on each other. And I think that's a conversation we really have not had in global health. Um, yes, it's important to protect the health of people in, in the Netherlands or in Germany or in Nigeria, in Brazil, but we all are part of a global community. So we can do both. But to do both, we have to have certain conversations that um, de-risk the sharing of data from each other. And I, I think that's, uh, there's some difficult negotiations and discussions that have to happen. Technically, I think most colleagues working in this space want to share. We realize the benefit of sharing, but it's, it's not happening enough. Uh, I've been following in another space, uh, difficult conversations happening in the World Trade Organization recently, and uh, in order to reach some form of agreement uh, in terms of that side of the world. And we recognize that is hard, but uh, I, I hope that the work that we're doing in the hub in, this, in connecting countries and not to be seen as a hub in Berlin that collects data, but one that really connects countries to share among themselves for their own benefit. And if we are able to enable that to happen, great. But we don't, e we don't want to be the interlocutors of the sharing. We, we don't want to be the middleman. We want to be an enabler so that the, they share among themselves, they realize the benefit, and then we can convene them and convene countries, and that's something we do very well in the World Health Organization, to define a, a framework that countries are happy to share data with that ensures that they derive the benefit, but also the rest of the world derives benefit from it. Plus, I do think we have to acknowledge that an incredible amount of data was shared during this pandemic. Yes. If, you know, it's starting at the start with the genomic sequence yes. very yeah. fast, um, the whole process of preprints, uh, of very fast sharing of information. So um, there is definitely also positive uh, news in that space. Absolutely. Thank you. And I mean, as people analyze these last two and a half years, they actually use that as an example, also the sharing of science, uh, despite you know all the IP discussions we've had, but a lot of uh, research was shared early on responsibly, etc. So we're nearly at the end. I have uh, two more questions, one uh, for Marian, which is uh, uh, a bit um, along the lines of, are there some interesting examples where the kind of thing you are calling for, the uh, one health surveillance, let me call it that, are uh, taken seriously, are being implemented, are already closer to policy than they might be in other places? You know, do you tell the Netherlands, ha, you should actually be looking at, I won't name a country, X? Uh, are there some that are further advanced we could learn from? Yeah, we were discussing that this afternoon. I was uh, struck by uh, how, uh, how sort of One Health has been picked up as a theme around MERS in the Ar Arabian Peninsula. And there's been quite some examples where, um, where really that, that was done. So there was public health side and the veterinary side uh, getting together um, 
with also camel owners that were not necessarily all too enthusiastic about <laughs> our uh, worry, our concern about their animals. So I think there are some very interesting examples there um, of, of really what I consider uh, quite nicely integrated studies. Um, there's also examples in the African region. Um, so far, I do see them as examples of communities of practice, mm -hmm. but it's not really so, sort of that is a sustained uh, and, and, and sort of a, a system that is being rolled out globally, but there are, I think, promising examples. And in the uh, uh, past, there was also a literature review that, that I saw recently. Um, if you look at really animal, uh, human and environmental surveillance, um, the arbovirus world has done interesting work, for instance, also around Rift Valley fever in relation to climate factors um, and also in, in Europe, uh, West Nile and, and, mm -hmm. and vectors. So there are, there are interesting examples. Thank you for that. And uh, Chikwe, I have to ask you the $150,000 question that you're always getting, uh, but it is very highly rated uh, by the audience here and uh, 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 online. So I have to ask you, uh, could you speak a bit about how concretely the hub is thinking of organizing itself in order to translate its aspiration of collaborative intelligence into practice, you have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're, thanks, Zona. <laughs> for the three minutes. We're, we're doing that in all sorts of ways uh, and really being intentional uh, about it. Um, I'll start with a really practical example. Um, in, in the office space that we're developing in the hub. Um, we are planning to fill only 50% of the available workspaces with staff from WHO. And the rest of the workspaces available will be filled by people that have expertise in different areas from around the world that we will invite to spend periods with us from a month to three months to six months or more that are working on some of these difficult topics. So collaboration always sounds very interesting, but to do it in addition to your full-time job is very difficult. So in addition to what I've just said, we're creating a whole department that we've called collaborative intelligence, whose role is to identify those opportunities identify the partners in addition to our key partners in Berlin, Charité, and the Robert Koch Institute, but to identify those relevant institutions around the world in academia, in philanthropy, in government, and bring them together to answer those questions. So whether it's in our recruitment, our spacing, our strategic planning, is really to, uh, and across all spectrums of how we're working, uh, to, to respond to the changes that have happened in the world. I imagine, Ilona, you worked with the World Health Organization many years ago. And, and my understanding of how WHO was perceived 20, 30 years ago was it was the go-to organization when you wanted data on anything or, or advice. And in a lot of ways, we are still that organization, but no longer the only one. And we have to accept that the world is changing there's expertise in other areas, and our role is to convene that expertise to make sense of the world, and not to think that we are the only ones that need, can be in a position to provide that information. And so in, it's really responding to the changes that have happened in the world, uh, demonstrate that we are an agile organization uh, that is responding to the changes that have happened globally, the fact that anyone can go online and check for a lot of the information that historically we would be the sole custodians of. And so how do we respond to that world? We respond to the world by not being the custodians of the information, but really to leverage our convening power uh, to bring together the expertise. So I don't know if that fully <laughs> answers the question of how, but those are just a few examples of how we are already doing this. These are not intentions. This is happening 
already in the hub in Berlin. Well, you nearly did it. Three minutes, come on. So the person who asked this question, we know who you are. Uh, you can uh, go up to Chikwe afterwards and uh, try and hear more about that. So uh, to end uh, this discussion, because we do want to be punctual and give you the opportunity to uh, network uh, both with uh, our speakers, but also with each other. Uh, there are some uh, people here working on One Health. I see, for example, one of the chairs of the Lancet Commission on One Health here. So that might be an interesting discussion you want to have. Uh, but as we end, uh, just uh, uh, a question uh, to each of you. Uh, Marion, if uh, um, the German Chancellor came up to you and said, what do I need to know about complexity of pandemics? <laughs> what oh would you tell him? Gosh, I think I would say, let's go and walk out in the field and stroll around and, uh, and let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> because it is, uh, yeah, it is a longer conversation. And but it's if once you get to see it, I think, uh, yeah, it, it takes awareness, and then it's obvious to me. Very interesting answer. Experience <laughs> complexity. Chikwe, what would you tell him? Um. <laughs> I probably will say this is that this is probably not as complex as we've made it out to be. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I, and to flip the question, I think we're very often um, stumped by the challenges that um, you know we face every day, and sometimes we have to force ourselves, and I do this myself as well, to really look at the other side. And when you force yourself you do see that there's been a lot of progress in many areas. And that then inspires you to keep pushing and looking for solutions where you may not have found any. So uh, pandemics are complex, but they may not, the complexity shouldn't stump us from uh, attempting to solve some of these problems. Thank you. I think that's a wonderful last sentence that we have here. You can see the German Chancellor walking through the fields. <laughs> Uh, with Marion and uh, having this uh, politically oriented solution focused discussion with uh, Chikwe, who, of course, as all of us do, would thank uh, the Chancellor and Germany for the support <laughs> of uh, the, uh, the hub here Absolutely. in Berlin. And many of the other things, let me refer also to the G7, the hope that there will uh, be. Uh, a real pandemic pact with uh, a lot of uh, uh, Im important elements. So we will see how this continues. We will keep you updated. The Hub has a regular newsletter. You will have seen that. And uh, I have been asked to really give you the message to reach out to the Hub. Already, Chikwe, I can tell you that there have been some messages and offers of cooperation. Uh, so uh, this is, I think, also a very helpful thing. Thank you for asking you. me to moderate this. It's been great fun. I still look over there and uh, sort of say, hey, guys, we're going to beat you. We won't have this future, as Axel Priest said. We're going to be better and more creative than that. So thank you very much. Enjoy the reception and have really good conversations. And clap. <laughs> So... Sure.